The Golem's Eye by Jonathan Stroud, uh, book two of the Bartimaeus Trilogy, book review. So this is part of my scripted book review series in which I go back through old blog posts of book reviews that I wrote years ago and try and make YouTube videos out of them for whatever it may or may not be worth. Uh, in this case, uh, this is a trilogy of books that I came across while I was living in Japan. Uh, and I mention that because um, I think maybe these books were more popular in Britain than in America. Although, correct me if I'm wrong, because I was living abroad during this period. Um, but, uh, yeah, th th this can happen when you're living abroad. I've mentioned this before. This, this is how I got introduced to the Discworld series. So the Discworld series is much more popular in Britain than it is in America. Uh, although th there are a number of fans in America, but uh, I didn't even find out about the Discworld series till I was living in Japan. And when I was in Japan, uh, the English section of any bookstore is very small. Uh, but when you get to the English section of the bookstore, they're not only catering to Americans, they're catering to all the expats, which includes Brits and stuff like that. And so there's a lot of books that are more popular in Britain. And I think this is one of them, because I don't remember hearing a lot about these books in Britain. But for a few years, uh, this trilogy of books was very prominently featured on bookshelves in Japan, which I think is because they were selling much better in Britain. Let me know if I got that wrong. Anyways, um, this is a... The, yeah. I always want to say Bartimus trilogy, but I, I think it's pronounced Bartimaeus is the name of the character, name of the trilogy. Uh, it's written for young adults, so it's, it's, you know, children's literature really. I mean, not young children, but, you know, children around 12, 13, 14, something like that. Uh, so as an adult, I'm kind of out of the target demographic of the books I'm reviewing, but I, I enjoyed them well enough. Um, the first book uh, in the trilogy is called The Amulet of Samarkand, and I never actually did a review of that book because I read it before I started regularly reviewing books as a project. I uh, read that book in the fall of 2005. But I'll kind of give a few brief sentences to kind of uh, sum up before I get into the second book. Uh, the first book, th these are all fantasy by the way, the first book tells the story of a young, mild-mannered British boy who's been abandoned by his parents and left with cruel step-parents, and he's in training to become a magician. Now, if this sounds like a story you've already heard before, yeah, there are, there are elements uh, here. But there's also a lot of uh, novelty and fun in this book to redeem it and kind of make it worth reading in spite of the fact that there are elements in here that is kind of a Harry Potter ripoff. Um, what, what makes the Bartimaeus books unique is that half of the story is told from the boy's perspective, but the other half of the story is told from the perspective of the demon. Uh, so at the very beginning of the first book, the boy summons the demon, and I guess according to the rules of this fantasy universe, by summoning him, uh, he's kind of conjured up and bound the demon to serve him with uh, uh, which are the rules. Uh, the boy only has fledgling magical powers. He's still learning how to use magic, but he's got just enough control to kind of bind the demon into his service. The demon that he uh, has conjured and bound is called Bartimaeus, and Bartimaeus will kind of narrate half the book from his own perspective. Uh, and Bartimaeus is this kind of old demon who's been around for thousands of years, not happy to be summoned up and bound by the boy initially. Uh, he's got a very sarcastic uh, tone, so he's kind of narrating everything sarcastically, like, oh, this stupid boy who conjured me up. Um, and He's also like, he's got this narration, but then he'll also attach footnotes to his own narration, which kind of adds additional sarcastic comments. I know this might sound corny, 
but it's pulled off rather well. Uh, it actually is quite enjoyable and quite funny when you're reading it. Um, and despite being a children's book or a young adult book, there's a lot of black humor in here. Um, and in addition even to the humor, uh, there, there's, a lot of, there's a bit of a high body count. So a lot of the characters, both the human beings and kind of the magical spirits or demons, uh, get killed off. So that adds a bit of a suspense to the narrative. Uh, because you never know what's going to happen to a particular character. You can't say, you know, because this is a children's book, nobody's going to die. Yeah, characters die. My biggest complaint uh, is the action sequences. Uh, it, do you say sequences for a book? Well, yeah, the action parts, sequences. Uh, even though it's a book and it's all down kind of on the printed page, I got a little bit confused. Uh, there are all these different spirits fighting each other and the action goes on on different magical planes of existence. And I just got confused as to what was happening where. But that being said, I'm not sure if that's the author's fault or my own fault. Uh, maybe I you know, was just too dense to kind of follow what was going on or wasn't reading it carefully enough. Anyways, here I am back with the second book of the trilogy. Now, second book of the trilogy um, picks up a few years after the first one. In the first one, the main character, who's a young boy named Nathaniel, was 11 years old and he was only an apprentice magician. Now, he's 14 years old and uh, I guess according to the rules of this universe, he's no longer a apprentice magician, he's now a government, a high level government official at the age of 14. So, yeah, it's a little bit of a stretch, isn't it? But okay, I guess you have to give this book the, the, some space. The premise of this fantasy world is that people can become high-level government officials at 14. Um, but yeah, I, I, I could buy it that maybe that was an option in this world, maybe. But um, you know, in the first book, I thought the, the character was 11. And I thought he was written realistically as how an 11-year-old boy would act. At this point, the character is 14, but I thought this is not how a 14-year-old boy would act. This is how like a 25-year-old yuppie would act, uh, not, not a 14-year-old boy. So that's the first complaint. Um, in the first book, uh, it wasn't, there were some hints, but it wasn't entirely clear to me that was going on in a separate universe. I mean, I thought this might be like kind of a Harry Potter thing where there is magic, but uh, you know, the magic world is all kind of kept hidden from the muggles. Um, so like it's going on in our universe, it's just kind of all kind of kept hidden from us ordinary folks. In this book, the second book in the series, it's become very obvious now that this is a completely alternative universe. It's an alternate universe um, in which uh, magicians are in control and it's kind of a dystopian 1984 type book. Magicians are ruled, ruling everything and the common British people are uh, just forced to be subservient to the magicians. Actually, interesting note, I'm probably the only one who cares about this, but um, they reference the magical history in these books a lot. And they, they reference this great magician ruler called Gladstone, who had this rivalry with a Benjamin Disraeli. And um, <clears throat> I consider myself a history buff, but I, I, went through stages in my life where I read up on certain things at certain times. And at the period I first read these books, I knew nothing, next to nothing, about 19th century British history. I have since then gone through a bit of a phase where I was quite interested in 19th century British history and read up about it and uh, <clears throat> have since read up a lot on the real Gladstone and the real Disraeli. and. I can now understand in retrospect why they're such fascinating characters uh, and why 
I, I guess Jonathan Straub must have thought they were fascinating as well because they, they're dead. I mean, they're, they're historical figures even within the realm of this novel. They're, they're long dead. But, but he keeps kind of referencing back to the great magicians, Disraeli and Gladstone. Um, now, in addition to Nathaniel and Bartimaeus, uh, this book focuses on Kitty Jones, who's not a magician. She's a leader of the resistance. So there's a resistance fighting against the magician's rule. This was set up briefly in the first book. Kitty appeared very briefly in the first book, but this is the book where we find about, out all about her. So because of that, uh, the book covers a lot of the narrative from Kitty's perspective, uh, and we have to go into Kitty's backstory to find out who she is and why she's involved in the, in the resistance and all that kind of stuff. And this book is almost more about Kitty than it is about uh, Nathaniel and Bartimaeus. Um, because of that, the momentum of the plot kind of stalls for a little bit because we have to get into uh, Kitty's backstory. But it takes a little bit, it takes a little while, but once all the elements of the plot get set up, and that does take about 300 pages, um, but from about page 300, once everything's set up, then it's a really interesting story. And from page 300 onwards, I enjoyed this book even much more than I did the previous one. Um, now again, despite being a, a book written for young adults, there's a high body count in this book. I swear the standards must have changed since the days when I was a, a kid. I, I, I don't remember young adult novels have, having such a high body count when I was young. Um, there is in particular a scene when the resistance fighters are on a, on a dangerous mission to rob a haunted tomb. And as they're in there, they find out just how dangerous this mission is because there are all these sorts of evil spirits. And the author draws this out so long, but he pulls it off. Like, he really does a good job of just keeping the suspense building and building and building for a long time. Uh, and at this point, you know that in this world, with this author, some of these characters could very well get killed off. So the suspense is real. And it's a long wait, but without spoiling anything too much, once the kind of horrifying payoff comes, it, it is truly a horrifying scene. So like the, the, the buildup and the suspense are justified in the payoff. Now Kitty is a, is a leader, one of the leaders of a resistance movement against the, the ruling class of magicians. Um, I find sometimes in these fantasy books or in these dystopian books, kind of the resistance movement characters tend to be kind of stock characters. You know, they're, 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 they're there because they serve a certain element of the plot, but they don't come across as real people. In this particular book, I thought they came across like real people. Uh, I thought all the characters in the resistance were lifelike. Uh, as someone who was involved in kind of uh, political organizing in my youth, you know, kind of sitting in on activist me meetings and kind of uh, witnessing to some of the discussions and internal squabbling that goes on. I thought that in this book, the internal dynamics and squabbling were very realistic and believable and kind of uh, very similar to what goes on in real life in these activist meetings. So, uh, yeah, I quite liked it. Um, I had plans after I finished this book to go on and read the third book in the trilogy, but I regret to say that I never finished it. For reasons I don't quite remember. Uh, I picked it up, I got about halfway through it, and then I just lost interest in it. Uh, I never really intended not to finish it, just as you do. Uh, you neglect it for one day, and then it turns into two days, and then it turns into 
a week or a month and then all of a sudden you've left it alone for so long that you can't really pick it up again without going all the way back to the start and I just never finished the third book. Um, I don't really remember what put me off at this point. Uh, I, I guess I must have gotten bored with it somewhat, somewhere. But um, yeah, that's kind of a strange note to finish on, huh? Uh, in spite of that, I really do remember enjoying the first and second books in this trilogy a lot. Although, like I said, the second book in this trilogy does, it does take a while to get all the pieces set up. So it does require a little bit of patience. But once all the pieces are set up, uh, then the payoff is quite nice.